We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. I'd like to uh, say hello, Sarah, and to ask you the first question. Uh, what on earth possessed you to, uh, uh, to decide in, for a career in uh, content, audiovisual content production uh, in Kenya? What hopes did you set out with and what uh, tough reality did you encounter when you set up your company? Hey, thank you so much and greetings to each and every one of you. Uh, I don't know if it's morning, afternoon or evening, um, but just greetings all the way from Nairobi, Kenya. I'm really excited to be here. And thank you so much, Batran, for inviting me to this platform. I have an, an interesting history because I actually wanted to be a doctor, believe it or not. Uh, and somehow along the line, I bumped into the media um, content space and I completely fell in love in love with it and in love with it in the in the in the sense that uh, the opportunity to be able to create uh, content um, for people to be able to enjoy and touch the different hearts of people across the continent and they always say content is king and uh, the one thing that i think also cuts across other than music irrespective of uh, the, the age or or the location is um, other than music is of course uh, entertainment information uh, as well as educative content so that is now what i completely fell in love in love with and just the power to be able to to do that and also have the opportunity to change to change lives uh, because with what it is that we do that's exact we have the power to be able to change lives for the positive or for the negative i choose to be able to see how i can be able to change uh, lives for the positive so even in terms of the content that we produce there has to be an element of specifically building hope over and above just entertaining or, inform, uh, or educating or you know sharing information there has to be an element of building hope because I just feel um, mainly as a society um, there's an element of hope that, that 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 is lost especially now with what has happened with COVID with all the negative uh, experiences that we've had we've each and every one of us has someone who we have lost or you know someone who has lost a business opportunity there's a, a major need to be able to uplift people and just build hope amongst uh, amongst our, our society so that's uh, the main thing that drove me to the space that i'm in wonderful so your company protel uh, studios uh, has a number of years and a very long track record in doing live uh, reality shows uh, sitcoms yeah. a lot of content initially for linear television and now evolving into other platforms one of the ways in which i describe what we do to people who don't know is describe it as an iceberg you've got the uh, the tip of it which is production and delivery but underneath is this big mass called development in which you take a long, long time sometimes to develop an idea into a script and then the script into something you can present to, say, a TV station uh, to pre buy Do you want to describe how you approach that creative initiation process? As it were? All right. So I, uh, you'll allow me if I can even see. Let me see if I can share my screen and just yeah, really just from, quickly. From, I don't know if you can see my screen. I think we can. If, please, uh, in the audience, you, you can. Can. But yeah, I can just, if I can put it in. Sure is it on maximum mode? It's all, it? all good. We can all see it. All right, cool. So Project Studios is a fully fledged um, uh, content uh, production company. And um, I've had quite a bit of experience in regards to working for media houses. I was running a, a media house in Tanzania called East Africa TV, which was the first um, the free to air TV station that would bro broadcasting simultaneously across the, the continent. I've also had an opportunity to work with the biggest content producer in the world, which is Endemo Production at that point. So I also had quite a bit of experience in regards to producing content that now uh, crosses borders. But even under Endemo, I also had an opportunity to travel to Nigeria and I was in Nigeria for, for six months producing a, a major uh, reality show. So at least I've also happened, managed to cross the continent and produce some content. When I was with East Africa TV, I was based in Tanzania. 
looking after Kenya, uh, the, the market in Kenya, Uganda, and, 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 and Tanzania. But now from, Anna, but I was based in Dar es Salaam. So it gave me an opportunity to really understand our, what we call our East African uh, market. So Proto Studios is an idea that was born when I was still in the media space because I have a love for producing content. So we started Protel in 2008, uh, but we opened our office doors on 4th January 2009 when I finished my endemol stint. What we do, we produce content ranging from documentaries. We love telling stories. Yeah, we love, we love bringing stories to life. So we do a lot of documentaries. We do a lot of TV commercials and documentaries for different corporate clients. I don't know if my slides are moving. They are moving. They're so good. They're, moving. they're doing, that. Uh, doing with them. Yeah, so we also do in terms of events and, and content productions, just building experiences for our audiences. Um, and then in terms of our TV program production. Now, this is the heart of ProTel. And this is the reason we set up ProTel Studios to be able to produce content um, for our audiences to be able to enjoy. And these are just some of the shows that we have produced of, over the years. And I'll try and concentrate on one particular one, which has been extremely successful. And these range from drama, uh, shows all the way to reality um, uh, to game shows. Um, 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 so, and these are just some of the shows that we have. We have over um, 1,500 hours of TV content of our own that we have produced over, over the years. But you'll allow me in terms of um, 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 how, how we go about it. I'll just stop sharing for a moment so as I speak. How we go about it, especially, let me concentrate on the TV program uh, content production space is um, uh, which is the heart, this is the reason why we set up Proto, is we'll come up with an idea, we'll sit down and understand uh, our target market. And as a company Proto, we have made a conscious decision to say that we want to be able to talk to the mass market. We want to talk to the maximum number of people that we can be able to reach to. So the content we produce has to be able to cut across the mass market. Yeah, which means even from a language point of view, from a storytelling point of view, it needs to be able to reach out to to this target market. So we go out and do our research and see what is this that people like comedy, but what space of comedy uh, do they like? Or if it's a drama series, what, what, what is it that we'll be able to use to be able to capture uh, the interest of our audience? So once we do that, we get into the, we come up with an idea, then we come up with the creative team or the scripting team, then we put together our script. And then now we go out, look for the talent in terms of the actors and all, and we get into production. Now, ordinarily, I mean, in, in the market, there are, two, there are two modes of, you know, of content production. You have some of the media houses who come to you and say, call to entry, we are looking for content of this kind, we're looking for a drama show, um, put in your idea or your creative pitch for it, and we as a broadcaster or a corporate are willing to pay for it, all right? Um, then the other model, which is what the, one of our main models, is we come up with the idea and finance the content and look for the ideal media platform to be able to put our content. And the reason we go for this model is the previous model that I've just talked about in regards to media houses coming and saying, look, we're looking for this kind of content and we're willing to commission, call it commissioning, um, uh, for that content. Once you produce that content from a commissioning point of view, this is in our local market, the media house who will be paying for 100% of that content will insist that they need to be able to own that copyright. So yes, they will pay you a premium more than you would get for licensing, but they end up saying, look, it's your idea, we know, yeah, you created it, but once we pay this premium for it, we want to be able to own it. What does that mean for me as a producer? I can't leverage on that content beyond that platform. All right. Now, the second model, which is the, our preferred model, is where we create an idea, look for financing uh, to produce it, then look for the media platform to air the content. And the reason we like this is because the copyright still sits 100% with us, which means I might not necessarily make as much money as commissioning, but my idea and my creative and my copyright is not just being handed over to, to someone else. And then what I have to be able to do as a company to be able to 
just even cover my production costs is probably air the content on multiple platforms to be able to cover my production expenses, what it is that I had invested in, in the content in, in the first place. One of our major pillars as a company is to be able to identify talent, nurture that talent, and then now once we give that talent an opportunity, now we let the talent go. We don't, even characters that we create, um, we have a very popular character called Jugush that we created. Now he's gone and blown up and, and become this massive celebrity in, our, in, in the country, which is something that we love because that's one of our pillars, identify well, talent, yeah. create, launch it and then now release it to the market now it's up to the talent to be able to see what they'll do with it once we have been able to also give them given them guidance as well as a training in regards to the industry because our industry also has you know quite a number of challenges in terms from also from a business and financial um uh, advisement point of view can i ask this so, so this sound, all sounds like if you want to run a business that has assets in it that you can trade and, and to, to, to cover your payroll and, uh, and develop new ideas, it sounds like you've got to take the second route to describe it. Instead of having a broadcaster say, I want this show with this, these kind of type of characters uh, and that length of time for each episode, and I'll pay for everything, but I have all the rights. You, in order to retain rights, you will take the financial risk yourself and then sell a, a license to the broadcaster. Will that license the broadcaster in the event where you, you developed it yourself? Will it cover the whole cost of production? Bertrand, can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Bertrand? Yes, I can. Uh, are you, can you, are, can you hear me, Sarah? Are you able to hear me? Sarah? Ah, are you, I think you're back. Can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Um, uh, my apologies. My Wi Fi is unstable. There's a, there's a bandwidth issue at your end, yeah. Hello. So sorry, everyone, we have, we're having a connection problem. Uh, if you bear with us, Sarah is going to rejoin in a minute. In the meantime, I can perhaps uh, summarize um, what she was saying, which I think was in extraordinarily clear about the two options she has as somebody involved in trying to maintain a sustainable production company in her country, in Kenya. But that's true all over the world. She can either have a broadcaster. Ah, Sarah is back. Can you hear? Can you hear us? You need to unmute. Oh, I can unmute you. I think. Yeah. No, no, no. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Sorry, I was trying to summarize what you were saying uh, while waiting for you to come back. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so yes, I was. Um, I was really asking, so what amount of risk financially do you need to take if you decide that you're going to keep uh, control of uh, the rights that you don't sell directly to a broadcaster? Does that mean that you will have to take a, 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 a larger and longer financial risk in terms of having to wait longer for your investment to be covered by various sales? Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. So it, it, it means, number one, you're taking a risk not knowing whether uh, you're going to get a return on it or not. So the first thing is, previously, um, we would rely on the media houses to be able to pick up our content and license it. So you're taking a risk with the hope that a media house will take your content and license it. But thanks to the digital uh, disruption that is currently happening across the world, digital now has put the power to us as content producers. And it's the same thing even with journalists. If you look at journalists before you relied on a journalist to write an article in the newspaper for you to be able to read it. But today, anybody can be a journalist. I can start a blog and we start getting a following and start writing. So the same thing with me in terms of production. So in 2009, uh, Google opened up YouTube to producers like ourselves so that we can be able to put up our content on the platform and to see, you know, um, um, 
uh, uh, you know, to, for us to be able to air our content. What did that do? It, it has, it, between then and now, it made it possible for me, instead of having to rely on the media houses, to be able to put out my content and have my viewers watch my content. So we decided to do, do that as a test because today, as I sit here, I have so many shows that are lying on our shelves because the media houses or whoever is in control within the media houses has probably felt that, no, this show might not necessarily work for our audience. So the hands within the media houses is on individuals who watch and they think they, can, they have a say in terms of what they think the viewer wants to watch. Now, that power has moved from that individual, those individuals, to the viewer. Now, I, as a viewer, I'm in control. I have all these options to choose from. And it is on so many platforms. So it started with YouTube, then the Facebooks also went into the video content. Now we are all the way into now digital platforms like OTTs. Now, what do OTTs do? OTTs now are giving you choice. If you look at a platform like Netflix, you have all the thousands and thousands of content that now you as a viewer have the power to choose from. Previously, you'd need to sit in front of the TV knowing that my favorite show comes at 8 p.m. So appointment viewing. So you have to be seated in front of your screen at 8 p.m. to watch your favorite show. But what digital now, the digital disruption has done, it has given me the power as the viewer to be able to decide what I want to watch, where I want to watch it, and from what platform I want to watch it from, even from the comfort of my mobile phone. So the control is now in the viewer's hands, all right? So when this happened in 2009, when YouTube gave us now that opportunity to be able to leverage on our content, we started putting it out. We started, we started you know, our channels, um, our own channels for our different shows. So like this was one of the shows that we started. It's a local uh, um, a comedy show called Apakula News. And we did decide to do a test because in Kenya, um, I mean, majority of our market, just like most of the countries, is the youth. And the youth mainly speak in the local slang. All right. So we created a show that we were speaking in just slang, no English, no Swahili. It was just that local slang. And it went crazy. And people kept thinking, these people are crazy. What are they doing? They're butchering English. Why aren't they putting content out in English? Now, from this show, also another show was born because it was kids. So this is one of our most successful shows. It's called The Real House of uh, Kawangware, which is a Kenya's, you know, it's a top comedy uh, drama show here. And this is the show that we did the test. And this we did in 2014, where we started a YouTube channel. It had been on air for about a year. We started a YouTube channel and we started putting the show on, on our YouTube channel. Now, it people went crazy because they were on a free to air channel. We were on um, a, a, a TV station called KTN. Um, KTN were airing it free to air. They would do a premiere and a repeat within the week. And then thereafter, we'd do a second run on, uh, on, a, on, a, on a pay platform. And then on top of that, over and above the two, we would now put it on YouTube. And then, right. as you can see, we have over 131 million views just for this particular show. Yes. Now, this was an eye opener for me. All right. It was an eye opener for me because what I realized then, uh, as long as I have direct access to the, my customer, who's no longer the, the media house, my customer is actually the viewer. As long as I have direct access to that viewer, then I'm okay, which is what digital has done for us. So over and above the YouTube channels that we've created for our different platforms, we have now gone to a different extent and we've said, look, we want to start our own over the top uh, platform, OTT platform like a Netflix or Showmax, and we want to put our, um, our content on there. So the viewer also has an opportunity to now watch it now more comfortably as opposed to like on YouTube where you have to keep skipping ads and all. So now the challenge is, is how do you monetize uh, the content to how do you make sure that you actually make money money for, from it but believe it or not it's actually easier than having to work traditionally like how we were doing with uh, the traditional media houses who would have to license our content and they would dictate how much they'll license the content for you thank you sarah i've just been waved at saying unfortunately we've only got five minutes left and we're, we've been given two minutes grace um, but you've covered an enormous amount of ground. I was just wondering, refer referencing the show that you just showed us, which got uh, 
130 plus million hectares. That's an asset that you own as a company and that you're now able to take into your next strategy, which I understand is to have your own internet-based platform. Do you want to talk a bit about yes. that in the closing minutes? Yeah, so, that, so that's what I was saying. So now we have decided now to take that that experience and we have created now our own internet-based uh, platform, which which now gives us the opportunity to be able to upload our content and uh, Batran, can you hear me? Sorry, you're frozen well. a bit. Yeah. yeah, okay. Um, we give us the opportunity to upload our content. So all the shows that we have created in uh, over the years, or even the past couple of months, that we believe from our research that um, uh, our viewer is interested in, and they can also change a life or improve someone's life. Yeah, now we put it on the platform, and now they can be able to watch the content as and when they want to, to watch it. If I was to take a TV station and buy airtime, the cost of that airtime will be so expensive for me as a producer. But now with internet-based and the digital platforms, you're able to do that with a fraction of the cost. Yeah, and it's changing. And, and nobody can be able to say today that they understand digital, digital media, because it's a continuously evolving platform. But one of the things that I appreciate is that it has given the viewer control of what it is that they want to watch, when they want to watch it, and at what, you know, on which platform they want to be able to watch. And it's given you through, uh, you know, the services that uh, are available on an internet broadband, a, a broader range of possibilities to monetize the content that you've worked so hard to develop at great risk to yourself. Great, great financial. It was in fact a question about how you monetize your content. Well, I think Sarah is saying at the start, YouTube was a vehicle, and I think that's on a rev on an advertising revenue share base. But for your own platform, presumably, will you have different price points, different ways of tailoring the content to the spending power of local consumers? Yeah. So with our own platform, what what it has it has it has allowed us to be able to have multiple ways that people can pay. You can pay per view, per episode. If you just want to pay per episode, subscribe subscription based, or you can subscribe for the week or for the month. But we also have free content that we are able to sell advertising space around for advertisers to be able to 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 advertise around that content. So what happens is we're able to give the um, um, uh, our viewers a free platform for the free content, but they also can pay a subscription for the content that is slightly more premium. You're getting a lot of affirmative kind of responses here, especially from Mr. Um, Kwame from, from Senegal, a very, very dynamic uh, production country, by the way. Uh, yes. uh, uh, in, the, in the literally two minutes that, that, that remain, um, what would you what you would be on your sort of wish list of measures that your government could take? I was ref talking in the beginning about the need to also incentivize local production for local content that reflects people's lives and their cultural preoccupation, social preoccupation, which you're doing with the house helps, for example, which is a very good yeah. example of that. Yeah. What do you need in order to operate better and, and, and keep keep the keep the company going sustainably? So, so one from a legislative point of view, the protection of copyright owners. Right now, that is a, a major issue within our country because you can very easily produce content and you'll find someone pirating it, selling it on DVD or airing it without necessarily paying for your content. Um, the, 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 the other thing um, is uh, in terms of, so the legislation ex ex exists, but enforcement I think is where the problem currently is. But the, the other thing is financing. So for example, today, if I go to any one of my banks and I tell them I have an idea uh, and I need a loan to be able to produce my content, they're not able to recognize our asset in regards to our creative work. Because you know how the banks have to be able to have either you know, an asset, a physical asset to be able to, to work with. But, and then even if, they, if, you, if you ask them for that loan and you say, look, I have an asset to give you, they're not able to finance you against a creative yeah. idea. So I think, and that's one of our biggest challenges as an industry because getting financing for our work, it's not, it's, 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 it's not possible. It's not possible at all. Well, there'll be all a right? day, I hope. So that is the, the one thing. 
audiovisual works as con are considered bankable assets. And in the meantime, we'll take your asks to the, the policy makers, wherever they may be. And thank you so much. You deserved an hour to, do, to begin to do justice to all the rich material you gave us. But thank you everyone for yeah. uh, coming in. Uh, and uh, to those of you who are still interested, there'll be another session from FIAP at 11 a.m. Uh, on Friday, where we'll outline our vision for the internet as a individual sector. Sarah's taken us a long way towards uh, uh, articulating this. And thank you everyone for your enthusiastic feedback on the chat there. And to the IGF staff. Thank you so much, Bertrand, and thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Bye bye. All right.